Wondering how your mindset affects your life? How to bring more energy into your business and life? Millions of people around the world ask these same questions daily. You are in the right place. Learn practices that will help give your life the meaning and success you've been searching for. Welcome to the Charge Podcast, teaching you how to create habits around real goals every day. Practical life advice from those who made it. Here's your host, Gary Wilbers. This sponsorship break brought to you by the Leadership Navigator Academy. Want to know how to protect good employees from the great resignation of 2021? According to a 2021 Gallup poll on retaining top talent, managers account for 70% of the variance in team engagement. They are the heart of the organization. Now, developing your managers is the key to creating an effective employee experience. At the Leadership Navigator Academy, we've created a learning and development program that invests in your leaders and holds them and your employees accountable. Enroll your leader today in the in-person 2022 Leadership Navigator Academy. Save $500 if you enroll them by December 15th. Check out the link at chargepodcast.com and click on the link for Leadership Navigator Academy. Chargers, welcome back again this week for another great podcast. I tell you, this fourth quarter is going quick, but the thing is, we're learning each and every week from different guests that's really allowing us to set up our first quarter of next year. So the thing I want to tell you, really what I concentrated on this quarter is getting you guests that will help you throughout 2022. Now, the hard part is you've got to implement and you've got to make those things happen, but I know you can do it as chargers. So let's get in today's guest. And I think you're going to really love this conversation. With us today is Joe Sanok. He's the author of the new book, Thursday is the New Friday, How to Work Fewer Hours, Make More Money, and spend time doing what you want. In this book, Joe empowers readers with a practical, evidence-based methodology to create their own work schedule and dedicate more of their precious personal time to pursuing their hobbies and spending time with their family and friends. Joe, it is great to have you on the Charge Podcast. Welcome. Gary, thank you so much for having me. Well, I am excited about this conversation. We were talking a little bit off air and I'll give it up to the audience right away. I made mention to you that I had about 30 days ago kind of made the distinction next year, I want to change where on Fridays is not a work day that it becomes a day off. And I've set this back three or four years ago. So I'm really interested to learn. And you know what they say about podcast hosts, they find guests that have answers to the questions they have. Yeah, that's the great thing about being a podcast host. So this is going to be one of those fun ones. But before we get into that, Joe, I shared a little bit about what you're doing now. But share us a little bit of your story because it took you from where you're at today. There's a journey normally that comes along with that. Can you share a little bit of that with us? Yeah, I am trained as a licensed professional counselor and as a psychologist. So I took a very traditional route uh, in that psychology world of first working in nonprofits, uh, then working at community mental health, and then eventually at a community college. Uh, so for years, helped uh, families, helped kids that were really angry, stole ones that stole cars, lit things on fire, like all sorts of different types of things. Uh, and then uh, started a side counseling practice. And in 2009, uh, really did that just to... Uh, be able to pay off some student loan debt. And over time, kept hiring people and realized I knew nothing about business. I had never had a business class. I'd never known anything about marketing. Uh, the, the only thing that I had that was close to it was I sold vacuum cleaners door to door in college for one summer and I hated it. It was slimy. They taught me how to sell a vacuum I didn't like to people that didn't need it. And so that's what I thought business was. Uh, and then I realized that you know, actually, you know, I love the field of counseling. It really helped people. And that as I learned about business there, uh, it, it was more that I believed in the product of counseling and that it genuinely helped people shift and change their lives. And so started podcasting about that in 2012, just what I was learning. And at that point, there were no other podcasts about the business of private practice. So from day one, I was number one. Uh, and so for years, uh, just had this side gig counseling practice and side gig uh, podcast business going. 
Uh, and then in 2015, left my full-time job to, to do those things full-time. And then in 2019, ended up selling that counseling practice. So since 2019, uh, I have uh, done the podcasting and consulting uh, and really kind of grown out that work to help therapists. But now it's moved into helping coaches. And we actually uh, oversee 17 different podcasts and help people launch their own podcasts now as well. Well, that is awesome. I appreciate you sharing that because I think it really sets the stage of your background um, kind of, you will know some of the science and some of those things that makes a difference there. But I think the thing also, I'm sure you found out as you started doing these side hustles, you could work all the time. Oh and, yeah. <laughs> Cause entrepreneurs, basically they find that niche, that need to fill every bit of their time. So let's go back and really start with a question that I think is important is, where do you think really the history of the seven day week and that 40 hour work week, where that came from? And how does that apply to really about our structure today of how we structure our work? Yeah. You know, when I started writing this book, uh, one of the big questions I had was where did we, how did we even get here? Are the institutions that we hold dear of the 40 hour work week are they solid? Are they unmovable? Or are they a bit shaky? And so uh, in my research and in looking kind of at the history, we have to actually go back several thousand years to the Babylonians. And so the Babylonians, uh, they looked up and they saw the sun, the moon, they saw Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and then they looked down and they saw Earth. So they saw seven major celestial things. And from that, they decided they should have a seven-day week. The Romans had a 10-day week and the Egyptians had an eight-day week. Uh, even you know, around 100 years ago, the Russians tried out a five-day week. Hmm. And so really, there's nothing in nature that points to a seven-day week. You know, a year makes sense. That's how long it takes us to go around the sun. A day makes sense. Months are loosely connected to the moon cycle. Uh, but a seven-day week, there's nothing in nature that says that we need seven. And so let's just start with the, the seven-day week was just made up by humans. Huh. So then fast forward to the late 1800s, early 1900s. The average person was working 10 to 14 hours a day, six to seven days a week. So they were working all the time. Uh, they were on a farmer's schedule, even if they weren't farmers. So then in 1926, when Henry Ford instituted the 40 hour work week at Ford, that was a huge step forward for the evolution of business, for the evolution of humanity. But it was really a selfish thing. He knew that people would not buy a car if they were trying to get to work faster. Uh, instead, he said, if they had a weekend, they would buy a car to go experience more on the weekend. So his goal was to sell more Ford cars to Ford employees, and it worked. And it took off. We saw it really you know, start to shape a society where 40 hours became the standard. But then in the 80s and 90s, we really see the, the rise of TGIF, um, ABC even named their Friday nights, you know, thank goodness it's funny, back with, you know, Full House and Urkel and all of that. Um, and we see casual Fridays start to go up on the rise. Uh, we see that it's appropriate to wear jeans on Fridays. So we see society starting to say, you know what, we're not going to really take Fridays that seriously in the workplace. We're going to have a baby shower and bring in some cupcakes and we're going to do cheesy team building activities. And it's going to be time that we also think about our weekends. And so it really starts to get shaky where this industrialist model starts to move away. So then the pandemic of 2020 hits in 2021 and globally, we get to see that we don't have to do things the way we thought we had to do them, not just in the business world, but in absolutely everything. It's really the last final nail in the coffin for the way that the industrialists think. For years, we've not thought of people as being you know, a machine or being part of just this assembly line. We know there's nuance to people. Um, we don't think of people like the industrialists did, but this, this pandemic really revealed that. So now we see this great resignation as people are coming back to work, they're realizing, oh my word, I'm working for an industrialist. They just care about 40 hours of butts in the chair and that's not how I wanna live my life anymore. Well, and I think that's really interesting because part of it is it sets into us that's that's the way we do it. You know, it's automatic. Anything over 40 hours, that's overtime, you know, and there's people put in 50 and 60, but the people have that set in their mind. So it's really about we have to change some of that. And you are kind of, I believe you're right on within 2020 and 21 with this pandemic, it has changed the way we think. But we also have to do it as entrepreneurs, as business owners, as coaches. We need to think about it differently. But then how do we handle that within our business? So I'm curious. I know you shared there's some neuroscience behind it and case studies in regards, in regards to how do we slow down? Because the problem is 
some of us have still not slowed down, even though the pandemic's hit, if anything, they put the gas pedal on because the worry and fear that they had. So how does that unlock if you slow down that it actually unlocks creativity and productivity with yeah, little the, science? Yeah, the old way of thinking uh, that the industrialists gave us was, you know, we see it in all these self-help books or business books. Here's the five ways to be more productive. Here's all of these. It's a prescription. Uh, whereas the big shift that's happening now is into viewing things like a menu, almost like how artificial intelligence gets smarter over time. We want to apply that same thing to how we do business. And so uh, that idea of starting with the productivity just isn't what the neuroscience supports. Instead, we want to first start with our internal inclinations, how we are internally, make sure that we're grounded there, uh, know where the gaps are, know where the opportunities are. Then we're moving outward into slowing down where we allow our brains to be optimized. And we know this intuitively. You know, when do you have your best ideas? Is, is it when you're stressed out and maxed out? Or is it when you're taking a shower or you're out for a run or you're on a long drive and you just have the radio off uh, and you just let your mind wander? Our best ideas don't come when we're stressed out and maxed out. When we're stressed out and maxed out, we go with what we know. We don't try something that's new. And then once we've optimized our brains, then we can move into absolutely killing it. Uh, and there's so many neuroscience techniques that show us that on a macro scale, um, that having the three-day weekend, uh, or even having one of those days be peppered into your actual work week can help us do more when we're actually working. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because I kind of set it up and I said it early on, Joe, you and I had this discussion that I told myself of May of next year is when I have that target set to do that. Because part of it is I have to change my internal clock to tell myself different. Because what have I done for the last 30 some years of being in business? I showed up Monday through Friday and sometimes on Saturday and Sunday, of course. And I've got off the Saturday and Sunday thing but I still have a hard time telling myself, okay, slow down. But it's so interesting what you said with the internal, when I go on vacation or go away and I get away from work, what happens to my creativity? It goes way up. So share with us, you know, because I've got quite a few entrepreneurs that get on here because this is, may have been their first thought of actually changing that paradigm. What's some suggestions that you would give to them? Well, I mean, the first one would be don't delay. And I would actually challenge you to not wait until May uh, because okay. I think you're going to learn so much in that process uh, because a lot of people have overvalued work and how much of their, their ego, their self-esteem, their image comes from working. And especially as entrepreneurs, we don't create things that we hate doing. Usually it's, we have all these great ideas and we're excited about it and we just want to run full tilt. So our challenge is less uh, you know, convincing a boss to give us that time off, but it's more, how do we rein in those, those good ideas and how do we make sure we're putting our time into the best things? Um, and actually, uh, Parkinson's law says work expands to the time given, uh, mm -hmm. we're finding that if you give yourself four days instead of five, you actually help yourself do the very best work. So I would say, Gary, if you think about, okay, what are the 20 things in a week that I need to do? Now I'm going to give myself one less day to do it. You're going to do maybe the top 12 or 15. Those are going to be the top 12 or 15 over and over and over. And then you're going to continue to scale even bigger. Um, what often happens is that last day that we give ourselves, it burns off energy. It's not actually the highest use of our time. Uh, and then we're not optimized for that next week. And so by starting even earlier than May, I'd say you're going to then be able to experiment and try new things kind of moving into that so that by the time May hits, you're just clicking on all cylinders and really growing and scaling in a different way. Um, the other thing in regards to the, just like that idea of our ego being so wrapped up into what we do, when we give ourselves that extra day off, um, it forces us to do a few things. Uh, it shows us how much we have put into our work, uh, how much of our ego and our tendency and our habits are to just go check email, to just go check this one little thing for me to continue to bootstrap it, even though I'm a business owner. And so it forces us to say, this is not the highest use of my time. I need to hand this off to my staff. Uh, I know that I could do this bookkeeping, but there's a reason I have a bookkeeper. So it really forces you to say, who am I outside of this job role, which then makes you more creative. It then also gives you more interesting stories that you can then bring back into the business. So I'm curious, Joe, let's go from this standpoint, because I'm sure if you wrote the book, Thursday is the new Friday, you don't work on Fridays. And you told us some of the things we get out of it, but can you share maybe a story with us that's your personal story 
that when the audience can resonate to? Because what I'm hearing or what I'm afraid the audience is, they say, well, that may be good for Joe, but that's not going to work for me. And I've already told you I'm interested, but you know, that person listening, they say, well, that's great. But you know, the problem is my business is open five days a week. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the big shifts is that we're applying these principles and we're testing and experimenting in how it works for your business. Just yesterday, I, I was on LinkedIn news and I was there with a the CEO that they found that taking Wednesdays off works better for their business. So they do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. This is company wide. This is a huge company. And then Thursday, Friday. And so we're experimenting and trying to see what works. We're not saying it's always got to be Friday, right. but we're saying, let's, let's try it. Let's, let's try from the menu. So I would start with that. Um, the other side of it is to make sure that we're thinking through, like, what are we doing personally? So in 2015, when I first uh, left the community college, that first summer I did an experiment. And I said, for the summer, I'm going to take, you know, Fridays off and just watch the numbers. So June of 2015 was the best financial month we had had to date. July of 2015 was better than June and August of 2015 was better than July. So then uh, in September of 2015, I decided I'm going to stick with that four day work week. And then over time, continued to do other time experiments, I, you know, tried out taking Mondays off in addition to Fridays, tried, you know, doing every other week where we took Wednesdays off, really forced myself to work as few hours as possible. And for me, one of the benefits personally um, is, you know, in the last year, I've been going through an uncoupling process where I'm in the midst of a divorce and I have my kids almost full time. And so just from a personal standpoint, to be able to say, I can be the best dad that I can be for these two little girls that pretty much have their dad in their life. And, you know, mom shows up, you know, a little bit each month. That's a huge shift for my kids. And so for me to be able on a Friday to say, I'm going to get all the grocery shopping done. I'm going to get all the errands done. I'm going to get all these things done. I, as a father can show up differently on the weekend than if I was stressed out and that we had to do all those other things. And so everyone's situation may be different. You may decide that that extra day, you're going to work out a little bit extra. You may find that you're going to get other things done around the house. You may decide you're going to go on a date with your spouse in the middle of the day. Like it doesn't really matter, but putting something into that time forces us to actually show up for ourselves instead of just going to our default of working more. Yeah. And I think that would be huge for entrepreneurs. I know it would be for myself is making sure that you had a plan for that day. Because if you just woke up, the problem is, is the work never stops. There's always an email, but being able to put that in there. I guess one of the questions I would have with this too, um, Joe, is it does not mean that Monday, if we, let's say Friday's the day that we decided is the best day for us. Does that, it doesn't mean that Monday through Friday, Thursday, then we work 10 hours to get our 40 hours in, right? That's not right. what you're saying, is it? So there was a, a study in Iceland uh, that just came out about a month and a half ago at the time of this recording. Um, it was a 2,500 person study. Uh, it was a multi-year study. So it was over multiple years and it was in multiple segments of the population. So it wasn't all bus drivers. It wasn't all nurses. Um, it was representative of Iceland. Um, and they found that a 32 hour week in four days um, was as productive or more than a 40 hour week. Meaning those last eight hours were basically a hobby at work. Like, do we want our work to be our hobby, or would you rather go do something else? Um, they also saw that health outcomes were better, happiness outcomes were better. Uh, and we see this over and over in different case studies. Um, Kalamazoo Valley Community College uh, in Southwest Michigan, down in Kalamazoo, uh, very traditional institution. You would think college, like that can't shift to a four day work week. There was this guy, Ted Forrester, who's an HVAC instructor there. Uh, he noticed in the summertime, this was five years ago or so, uh, that there were hardly any students on campus on Fridays. So in the summer, he went up to the roof every single Friday, took a picture of the parking lot that was empty, and then compared that to the fall parking lot, and then presented to the board, here's what our summers look like on Fridays. Here's how much it costs to air condition empty buildings. Uh, and then they said, well, what should we do? And he pulled out this USB drive and he's like, well, I happen to have a whole presentation here. Uh, and the man was prepared. Uh, and he talks about why a four day work week would save $2.5 million. And so they switched over to a four day work week in the summer. They have a 36 hour week during that time. And HR quote donates the last four hours uh, and they've saved over $2.5 million. Plus they also have better health outcomes. They're retaining people. You know, uh, people don't want to take off uh, to a different job when they have a four day work week in the summertime uh, and student success has gone up. And, and so when we actually look at some of the data, uh, we see that as you experiment, as you try, as you um, 
just think differently about the way that you judge the outcome of your business that oftentimes a four day week ends up being as productive or more than the typical 40 hour week. Yeah, I'm glad you shared that because I know I've done some research and uh, um, another company that I know has done some research on that and saw actually productivities go up instead of down what people think. And as owners, we have to think differently. And sometimes our worry is, will we be able to get it done? And I will tell you, I brought a new employee on um, this summer and we do a 36 hour work week um, with her. Um, and we've seen the productions there. And what I've always told her, I said, this is a trial. And I said, if you know the workout output is not there, we will switch over. Um, but as long as it's successful, we're going to stick with it. And we've not changed it yet because I've seen great results from um, what we've been able to do there. So it's a lot about changing your own mindset. So if you're a business owner, you don't have as much flexibility. If you're one of those, you're working for someone unless they decide to do it. But maybe you pick up Joe's book and read it yourself and then pass it on to that business owner. And maybe they'll think differently as they go through that. One of the things you really talk about too is really about productivity, Joe. And I think this is important because it ties with this. How do we make it more efficient and more effective? And you talk about these sprint types. How does that really work? And can you share with the audience how that works? Yeah, so sprint types are similar to personality types. Uh, you know, when you know your, whether it's your Enneagram type, your Myers-Briggs, whatever uh, personality type uh, inventory you enjoy, it gives you clarity on your natural tendencies. Uh, and, and in the same way, the research emerging uh, is showing us that there are sprint types. And so the first part of your sprint type is what type of work you're doing. And so if you are a time block sprinter, uh, that means you're the kind of person that wants to have one particular task, typically that you're working on over a one to four hour period of time, broken up into 20 to 30 minute segments. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs may describe themselves as being ADHD or squirrel syndrome or however they describe it, shiny object syndrome, you hear all these, these yeah. things. I would highly recommend then you have a shorter period of time. Maybe you have a 10 minute sprint and you have a timer that goes off. The University of Illinois actually did a study that found that if every 20 minutes you have a one minute break, uh, that it completely eliminates vigilance decrement. Vigilance, how well you pay attention to something, decrement meaning that it breaks down over time. And so at the end of that task, you'll pay attention just as well as you did at the beginning. And so what you're doing is you're breaking that up. You have one task over and over. Whereas a task switch sprinter is someone that needs that variety. They need to be switching tasks. Now we're not talking multitasking. That's a myth. The research has proven that over and over, uh, that you get less done when you're multitasking. So you're still saying, what am I going to do over this particular 20 minutes? What am I going to achieve? I'm going to sketch out a blog post. I'm going to look at my profit and loss statement. I'm going to um, look at some media that we can get for my company. What is that thing that you're going to do that you can achieve in 20 minutes? And then you do it. And then you have your next 20 minutes. Uh, and so figuring out, do you need that variety or do you need to kind of get into flow into one thing? The second part of your sprint type is when you do it. So an automated sprinter is someone that has it in their calendar and it's on repeat. So when I was writing Thursday is the new Friday, every single Thursday, I was writing the book. Uh, I would wake up, I would protect my brain. I would do all of these other things I was learning from the neuroscience of how to optimize that time. Um, and I would only work on the book and it was every Thursday. So I was doing the time block sprinting and the automated sprinter. So those two combined. Whereas there's other people that they need to get away. They need to go away for an intensive. So an intensive sprinter is someone that maybe quarterly will go away for a three-day weekend. They'll get an Airbnb. They'll go just run full tilt towards certain aspects of their business. Uh, you know, Bill Gates famously does his think week where he takes, you know, a ton of books and he goes and he reads them all, you know, when he's, you know, out in the woods and then he just thinks, um, other people like Dr. Jeremy Sharp from the testing psychologist podcast, he'll go away. He'll get, uh, an Airbnb. He makes sure it's walking distance from a vegan restaurant and he just kills it for a weekend. Uh, but he brings a lot of different types of work. So he works on his podcast. He also works on his counseling practice. He works on sketching out his media calendar. So he's then doing the task switching within that intensive sprinter. That is awesome. And I think that's a key is really understanding yourself and how do you work best. And then I'm so glad you said, break the myth that you think you can multitask. Too many people are doing too many things at once, and then we're getting absolutely nothing done. And that becomes the real key because that's what increases your productivity. And then really look as far as business owners, one of their challenges is reduce the amount of 
projects or goals that you really have? Because, you know, to be effective, it's one to three. And if you have more than that, your kind of wishful thinking is what it really comes to. Joe, before we've got to go to the recharge round, and I will tell you, Joe has convinced me, and I'm going to ask Joe to be my accountability partner here. My goal is to start this by January. I'm going to do some testing um, the rest of this fourth quarter, but my goal is to start it in January now, and I'm going to ask Joe if he'll hold me accountable to that, So, and I'm going to be reading his book, so I get some of those tips, and we'll share that with all our audience, how they can get their copy here in just a minute. But the last thing is really not a question, more is if, like myself, I was already interested, but now we've made them intrigued. What would you tell them to get started? Yeah, the, the one thing I would say is look at this future weekend. And I want you to add something and remove something because often we go to productivity as entrepreneurs, but the best thing you can do to recharge your brain is to slow down. And so what do I mean by add something and remove something? I want you to add something into your weekend that you know is just going to light you up. So it could be that you have a novel that's been on your nightstand for months and you haven't emotionally given yourself permission to spend a couple hours on Saturday drinking green tea and reading this novel. Um, maybe it's that you have a friend that every time you see that friend, you say, we should get together sometime. Uh, and that sometime just never comes. Uh, finding one thing that you can add to your weekend that just really lights you up. And again, we're doing this from an experimental standpoint. You may think that reading on a Saturday morning is going to really recharge you, but at the end of it, you're like, eh, that wasn't really as good as I thought it was going to be. Great. You have data on yourself. The other thing is to remove something. So maybe you have a friend that you're scheduled to get coffee with on Saturday. Saturday morning. And every time you leave talking to that person, you're drained, you feel like trash. They're, they're just a toxic person. You are old enough to stop hanging out with toxic people. So remove that from your life. Maybe, you know, there's, you know, some lawn care or some snow removal or, you know, something in your life that you're just like, I don't want to do that. You know, maybe outsource that this weekend, maybe groceries. You're like, I don't want to go and spend three hours fighting crowds and figuring out groceries, pay the extra 20 bucks this weekend to have groceries delivered to yourself. So when you remove something from your schedule, it again, gives you data. Uh, I know for myself, you know, I've learned that, you know, blowing leaves or, you know, shoveling snow, I like the physical activity of it. And I get to be away from my daughters for a little bit. So maybe I'm not going to outsource that quite as much as I might outsource grocery shopping. Like, I don't want to go do that. And so figuring out for yourself, the add one, remove one is the first thing that you can do to really start to optimize your brain over the weekend so that you can absolutely kill it next week. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's great advice. I'm going to even try it myself. Now, Thursday is the new Friday. Tell them how they can get their copy, Joe, and then we're going to go into the recharge round. Yeah. So wherever you buy your books, whether that's your local bookstore or online or Audible, uh, it's available everywhere. It's through HarperCollins. So uh, anywhere that you get books, uh, you can find it. And uh, we also have some bonuses over at ThursdayIsTheNewFriday.com, where if you buy five or 10 books, um, you get access to some of our recorded uh, courses around taking those next steps in regards to making Thursday the new Friday. So if you buy five or 10, you get those bonuses that we have over at ThursdayIsTheNewFriday.com. And we'll have that all in show notes. And also we'll share with you, he's on Twitter, Instagram, then LinkedIn. We'll share that at the very end also for our audience, because I think this is a topic that they're going to be very interested in. Joe, just a few questions. I have three questions in the recharge round that I want to ask you that we'll kind of hit real quickly. The first one is charge. It's create habits around real goals every day. We've been kind of talking about those. But for yourself, what is the one habit that's really helped you propel forward in your life? For me, I would actually say that they're combined. It's two different habits that to me are essential for me uh, together. One is meditating. Uh, for me, that helps me just feel the world outside of just my own physical self. Uh, and then in addition to that in the morning, uh, I do a morning walk often with a neighbor. Uh, and that just uh, allows me to step outside of my achiever self, which comes very naturally for myself. And, and to see myself as first a human that's doing the achievements instead of being defined by the achievements. Excellent. I have a little acronym and I've shared with the audience over this year, a simple positive action that they can take um, that really helps them. What's that simple positive action for you? I would say that, you know, we are more disconnected physically than ever uh, as a result of the 2020 and 2021 pandemic. Uh, a simple positive action is to text someone that is, is meaningful to you. 
Um, for me, I've really tried to continue to get to know dads that are at my, my daughter's school um, and to just have short conversations with them that eventually lead into longer conversations and then friendships. Uh, I think so often we just have our cliques of friends that we've always had. And there's so many people out there that are interesting uh, that I want to get to know. Uh, and so just having those small steps into different and new relationships, I think is such a simple positive action you can take. That is a great one because you are correct. We're connected with a lot of people, but we're not really connected with a lot of people. Um, I believe that wholeheartedly. Share me with us your biggest life lesson and what did you learn from it? Mm. You know, I think my big, one of my biggest life lessons, uh, I, I in general have a hard time with like, this is the one life lesson uh, right. to narrow it down. Um, but I would say that um, kind of through this uncoupling process, through having had cancer in 2012 and a number of other trials in life, um, seeing myself, uh, not as my memories, not as my trauma, not as someone that's pursuing, you know, all these experiences or avoiding all these negative experiences, but really understanding that at my core awareness of my own awareness, uh, is the deepest sense of who I am. Um, and really learning that on a regular basis where, you know, that I have not landed on always believing that. Um, but to really understand my awareness and really understand the present moment, um, it's an ongoing practice uh, that to me has really shaped and shifted the way that I view life. What a saying there, folks. I've got to share that again. Awareness of my own awareness. Think about that for yourself. What do you need to be aware of in your own life? I think that's really a message. And that's really what we're saying about what we were talking about today. What did changes do you need to make as we're getting ready to go into 2022? Joe's book is a great resource. Thursday is the new Friday. Make sure you check that out anywhere you buy books or go online um, to his website. Thursday is new Friday. He said he's got some special incentives if you buy the books from his website. So please check that out. Joe, share with them also as far as you're on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, I see. How can they connect with you? And we can put it all in there. So if you give them maybe the Twitter, we'll put them all in the show notes. Sure. So uh, you can find me, Joe Sanok, everywhere you look uh, on Instagram. I'm practice of the practice. Uh, that's my main other website of helping coaches and counselors start, grow and scale their private practices. Uh, and then I also have the practice of the practice podcast. We've interviewed over 700 business leaders there. Uh, and then also the Thursday is the new Friday uh, podcast where we're going deeper beyond the book um, to talk about the four day work week and in season two spotlight people that have switched over to the four day work week. Excellent. Well, maybe I'll get spotlighted next year yeah. as I go through my process here. That's yeah, the... I mean, we're accountability partners there now. So uh, an even bigger incentive to switch over. That's right. I appreciate you, Joe. And I really want people to take a listen to this. And maybe you're listening and maybe it doesn't work for you because you don't own your business. The question is, who do you know that you could share this with and maybe give them a different way of thinking? And I think that's really what we have to do. Really what the pandemic should have done for us, should do for us, is give us a new way of thinking about business. And I think if we do that in business and life, that's where we make the changes and where we really create that charge in our life. So Joe, thank you so much for joining us on the Charge Podcast. Gary, thank you so much for having me. Chargers, now my action for you is, Go get his book, Thursday is the new Friday.com, or go to wherever you buy books and make sure you pick that up because I think it'll make a big difference in your life and help support Joe on this and then share that with somebody else in your line of influence that you want to have that book. And I think you'll make a big difference to him. Chargers, come back again next week. We'll have another great podcast guest and we're getting you ready for 2022. So make it a great day and we'll see you back here next week. This podcast has ended, but your life doesn't just stop. To continue your inspiring journey, head over to chargepodcast.com and access all the tools and resources mentioned on today's show. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing with somebody who may also benefit from the advice provided. That's chargepodcast.com. Until next time, charge in business and life.